After Israel admitted killing seven foreign aid workers in Gaza, there have been hopes that the humanitarian situation might ease and that desperately needed food can begin to reach the hundreds of thousands at risk of famine. But how realistic are those hopes? My guest is Jan Egeland, head of the Norwegian Refugee Council, with decades of experience in the humanitarian field. He's also a former diplomat who was closely involved with the Oslo peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians in the 1990s. How does he think this savage war can end? In six months, the war must be over. I, I hope it's over in, in a week, really, and, and that we are spared for the bloodbath in Rafa. Egeland says the pulverizing of Gaza now ranks among the worst assaults on any civilian population in our time and age. Why was there no power on earth that could stop it before so many were killed? Jan Egeland, welcome to Complex Zone. Thank you very much. After the killing of seven aid workers in Gaza by Israeli troops, there's been new hope that the, the aid situation might improve on the ground to some meaningful degree. Do you think that hope is justified? Yeah, the hope is justified. I, 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 we desperately need it. We haven't seen much proof of it. Perhaps a little bit more trucks coming over the Kerem Shalom uh, border crossing in the south. I haven't seen trucks coming through the northern border crossings yet and there's still a lot of restrictions on internal movement inside Gaza that Israel controls completely now except for Rafa in the south with their military troops. You mentioned Rafa if the uh, onslaught if the advance Israeli advance goes ahead in Rafa what would the situation be there then? I mean it would be horrific beyond belief I was there myself uh, five, six weeks ago. It's, uh, it's a place like nowhere else in the world. It's, it's in effect the largest refugee camp on earth. 1.4 million people crammed together in an area which is like one seventh of the municipality of Oslo where uh, I live. These people are, have fled two, three, four, five times, most of them, they have nowhere else to go because they cannot flee into Israel from where their ancestors hail, nor can they go into Egypt. So they're trapped there. Uh, could they go north? Perhaps they could flee north. What would meet them there would be a heap of ruins. It's, it's, it's a horrific thing. It would be a bloodbath to go into Rafa. That's why we're fighting this very idea. It's an affront to humanity to have a war in a refugee camp. But even without Rafa, the statistics are, are pretty horrendous, aren't they? Those from the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs um, released on April 6, 1.1 million people in Gaza experiencing catastrophic food insecurity. Yes. There are no quick fixes to that, are there? No very quick ones, except that, listen, there are hundreds, thousands of trucks that could go across the border crossings in the north to the famine-stricken north tomorrow. I mean, it, that if the tanks can easily go in and out from Israel, why couldn't eight trucks go, go in and out? This is a, a man-made famine from A to Z, it's 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 not the 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 drought of Somalia and elsewhere. This is a famine made by a war and made by a blockade that Israel has imposed on the innocent Gazans that did not to the large to to ninety nine percent not participate in the horrors of the seventh of October. Britain's foreign secretary. David Cameron said last week what we were told was previously impossible, he meant, by the Israelis, suddenly became possible. Ashdod port and the Erez crossing will soon reopen, water will be turned back on, more aid will flow through Kerem Shalom. Um, 
is he right? Uh, do you see movement that would tell you that this is now happening, that there's been a change of heart on the Israeli side? Well, I think finally the United States, Britain, even Germany to some extent, is exerting the pressure on on the Israeli war machine to behave according to to the laws of war that we didn't see in the in the first five months at all. We're seeing some of that now. And then comes the promises that the port Ashdod would open, the border crossings would open. They haven't so far. Uh, there has been more trucks coming over Kerem Shalom in the very south. Yes. But it's still very hard to get enough trucks going north to that horrific situation where hundreds of thousands of people are in effect in in famine. So what I hope is that those who provide the tools for this, the arms for this, the bombs for this indiscriminate assault on Gaza, and they are the United States, Germany, and to a lesser extent, the UK and other Western countries, they need they need to really exert some real pressure and and also stop providing arms to something which is undoubtedly indiscriminate. We proved that from the first week in the response from Israel after the horrific attacks on the 7th of October. You seem to be saying that the Western countries which are on the one hand supplying arms and on the other hand calling for an end to the, the fighting or at least uh, a humanitarian pause are hypocritical. Is, is that your view? Uh, yeah, yeah, they are... Uh, it, they are seen as hypocritical by the world, but but that's more than anything that uh, uh, occupation and 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 the pummeling of apartment houses and the turning off uh, electricity and 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 water is very bad in Ukraine, as we all all agree. But it's somehow tolerable when Israel is doing the same. That's what the world sees as industrial scale hypocrisy. What I would say is that they have been um, astoundingly impotent in that diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel. They, they must have seen, because we provided the evidence for that, that the assault was indiscriminate from October 12th uh, last year. They, they know that we were never allowed access to, to Gaza as we should as humanitarians. I warned them myself in letters to the US administration and to the EU in mid-October that if they allowed Israel, which is a belligerent here, to control the border crossings completely with their military staff, it would never work in terms of humanitarian access. So they knew all of this and they did very little, but they continued to provide arms for all of this. What was their response when you gave them this warning? Well, well, to some extent, we didn't even get an answer. But when we got answers, they said, well, we take it for granted that Israel is uh, is following the, the rules of uh, a war, humanitarian uh, law of armed conflict. We are urging them to provide humanitarian access. We will tell them again to provide humanitarian access. We are telling them to to uh, shield the civilian population. And then we told them, but you must see yourself. They're not listening. And I've said several times, to me, it's like putting your fingerprints all over a crime scene. If you provide 2,000 pound bombs to a place where one apartment house, civilian full of families, is pummeled after the other, how would you not have complicity in what's happening? How do you explain this diplomatic impotence, as you call it, from the Western nations? Yeah, I mean, I, I still have problems in understanding it because I think it was a strategic mistake of enormous proportions in the beginning uh, that they didn't understand and learn from 9-11 in the United States where the whole world went from having 
full sympathy with the United States. Everybody. And then little by little, people saw that there was waterboarding and black sites and 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 the 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 U.S. lost its moral hound, uh, high ground, and it became some kind of mud wrestling match with these uh, horrific uh, organizations. The same thing they must have have foreseen when they went to Israel and said what we all felt that there was a gruesome. Hamas attack on the on the Israeli civilian population, and and I, I have condemned those who say no. This was an uprising against occupation. This was legitimate uh, because of what all that Israel has done. It was not. It was killing of women, children, concert go goers, farmers and kibbutzes. It was horrific and condemnable. But but then to to go there and say. We're behind you, whatever you do. That was basically the message. Then the, the, then the assault came, and then it's very hard to say, oh, 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 stop what we let you start. As the war has gone on, many countries have continued to repeat the mantra that Israel has every right to defend itself because it suffered horrendous casualties on October the 7th. When you look at the statistics of this conflict, particularly those relating to Palestinian children, nearly 26,000 killed or injured so far, according to Save the Children, is that, in your view, defense? Can it be described as defense? Uh, 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 no, no, it's far beyond legitimate self-defense. And, and of course, as well as a right of self-defense. That's what all, all, all those Western leaders providing the arms say. It's legitimate self-defense. Um, what the U.S. even said from from a relatively early on was there have been targeted operations against the Hamas fighters. What they decided to do was, and they made it clear, these uh, the, the Netanyahu government, the most extreme in the history of Israel, by the way, with ministers who who who, who have said things that that are condemnable, really. They said, we will make basically Gaza unlivable. We will change Gaza completely. We will not let in food. We will not let in uh, electricity. We will not let in, 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 in water. That's what they said early on, many, many ministers. So how could it become a surprise when they saw what happened? You've seen plenty of conflict over the years, but you wrote in February, to stand in the ruins of Gaza is to be overwhelmed by the abject failure of the international community. For four decades, my work has taken me to many war zones, but I've never been confronted by anything like this. What, what was the this that confronted you and left such an abiding impression on you? Yeah, I'm glad you're 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 putting that question because there are some very unique features around Gaza, and then there are some that are not that unique. I've also been of late to the Chad Sudan border and met the tens of thousands of people who have fled the abject horrors of Darfur in Sudan massive sexual uh, uh, violence, massive amounts of massacres, and no aid to speak of, and poverty beyond belief. And many more people live that kind of a reality in the Sudan now than in Gaza. So what's unique about Gaza is, number one, there is no escape. There is no chant or for... Or, or Poland, or Lebanon, or the Palestinians, they are trapped inside a densely populated area. And that's the other one. I mean, they, they, this is densely populated without escape. Thirdly, it's a more intense bombardment in this small place than in any other place in, in, in recent memory. And then the lack of adequate access for humanitarians to assist them, not 
because of lack of resources, because the, the, the border crossings are controlled with a belligerent that is not allowing it to go in. And then finally, what's unique is that our generous donors that help us in Ukraine and in Sudan and, and, and in so many other places, the Western countries, are, are actually playing a very negative role here because they have, uh, they have provided the tools for the attack. So we are at odds with the, with the governments that you, we are usually aligned with. But even um, without that uh, being aligned with Israeli policy, even without that, you say they could have done much more when it comes to delivering aid to Gaza. You said, I would say to the countries like the UK and US, why haven't they organized their own convoys into Gaza? They can under international law. How come Israel is allowed to control all going in, even at the Egyptian-Gaza border? International law says you have to enable enforced relief to people who are starving if there is a belligerent who is denying it. They could have simply turned up at the border with their aid and yeah, I think they could. obliged the Israelis to, to let them in? Or gone across the Egyptian border with uh, in, 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 in cooperation with with um, with Egypt and said, hey, uh, Israel, are you going to bomb this US, UK, German convoy that is going with food and other humanitarian relief that we, friends of Israel, have monitored ourselves? Of course they wouldn't have done that. So uh, i I'll give you another example, Tim. In, in Syria, there is an area controlled by by armed opposition groups. Some of them of the kind of a character, perhaps, that would be Hamas, uh, Islamic uh, groups. Uh, one of them pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda some years back. To that area, the convoys go over from Turkey. And there is a UN security resolution en enabling that, and it's monitored by UN monitors, and it, the, 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 the aid flows very well, and it's not like they are asking Assad, the, the, uh, the uh, Syrian government in, in Damascus, for, for permission. There is a lot of precedents. They could have done this according to international law, and they didn't. And when you asked them about this, what was the response? that uh, no, we have to cooperate with Israel, and uh, Israel is uh, uh, insisting to control every single kilo that goes uh, across the border, even from, uh, from Egypt. So so our uh, arms are tied, really. We, we, we're, we're impotent. They admitted that? They admitted. I mean, that, that's uh, by, by, by also by, by their deeds. I mean, I mean, not a single truck goes from Egypt into directly into Gaza without it having been monitored by Israeli forces in in uh, on, on the Israeli side of the border it's uh, it, there we have a you, you should go and see it's a line to come in the line to come in the queue to be monitored and and cleared to go back and into the no man's land to be reloaded in local trucks to go to uh, to to the starving children of uh, of Gaza. It's a, it's a it has been a defunct system from day one. Jan Egerland, where do you see all this in another six months? More violence, more suffering. I I, I really think them it will. It, it, we, we, we will not have this assault forever. In six months, the war must be over. I, I hope it's over in, in a week, really, and, and that we are spared for the bloodbath in Rafa. But then we may have less attention and a ruined Gaza that needs somehow to become livable for the people who may still be trapped there, most people will, well, I think, want to leave. 
Uh, that that's what they told me when I was there. This the fight. This the final of all of these wars has made us believe this is no future for our children. We will try to go to Europe. We will try to go elsewhere. So I think there will be an exodus. I think there will be too little resources for the rebuilding. My organization, the Norwegian Refugee Council, has been charged by by leading the cluster of organization responsible for shelter, housing, if you like. There are 400,000 plus homes destroyed or damaged. 400,000, more than that. It's, it's, it's beyond belief and that needs to be rebuilt. And six months from now on, people will still be living at best in tents. Do you think many of the Palestinians will get pushed into the Sinai? There have been rumors that Egypt has actually been haggling over the price for accepting them. Do you believe those rumors? Well, what, if, what I understand is that the extremists in uh, Israeli politics and Israeli cabinet want to ethnically cleanse people out of Gaza and into Sinai from where they will not necessarily have the right to return to a rebuilt Gaza that uh, that may now even be be uh, colonized by the settlers who are celebrating in Israel the, the what is happening and their hopeful uh, uh, stealing of of the land from the uh, from the Palestinians. So all of this we have to fight. Where it, it none of this is a given. All of this can be reversed, and I hope that Israel, that needs to have recognition, needs to be living in security, needs to not be attacked by extremists as they were on the 7th of October. I hope that Israel will come to the senses. I hope that the United States, UK, Germany, and others will understand that it is counterproductive for Israel what has been done in the last few months. If, they, if we want Israel to live in security and in peace and in recognition, being recognized by their neighbors, there has to be a completely different uh, uh, policy, policy from Israel. You were closely involved with the peace talks that led to the Oslo Accords between Israel and the Palestinians in, in 1993, accords which ultimately failed to bring a lasting peace settlement. But you have said that the leaders who are now in key positions don't have the same stature, aren't of the same caliber that they were in 1993, that they're populists on both sides. What can you expect from those populists, as you call them? Yeah, I, 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 I say it's a, it's a complete lack of, 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 of leadership. Of course, uh, extremists took cabinet positions in Israel and uh, and uh, on the Palestinian side they are split and Hamas assaulted Israel on the 7th of October and killed hundreds of civilians. Uh, the pa pa Palestinian administration is very weak and old. Um, so what I what I hope is that the is Israeli political establishment, will recognize that their ways have been counterproductive for the future of Israel. I hope that on the Palestinian side, there is a recognition that we need to be uniting and we need to have a new, we need to cooperate as Palestinians for a future, that there will be new leaderships on both sides and more, most importantly, we need the United States, we need the European Union, and we need the Gulf countries and, and, uh, and Egypt and Jordan, the two most important neighboring countries, to cooperate in, in posturing for a solution. Because I think alone, Israelis, Palestinians will be incapable and unwilling to find a common future. You getting any sleep these days? Is there any kind of realistic hope that you're managing to cling to. I wonder what the effect is on you of all the suffering that you've seen close up. Well, I, 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 
I feel that this has been one of the worst periods of my 40 years as a humanitarian worker because the needs have grown so exponentially. The resources available for our solidarity has leveled off or gone down. And international politics uh, or international relations are not constructive nor effective nor efficient. Um, but we're not giving up hope. Yeah, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for being on Conflict Zone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>